Today's scripture reading comes from Philippians chapter 3, verses 1 to 11. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs, look out for the evildoers, look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision, who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus, and put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may obtain the resurrection from the dead. This is God's word. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Great to have you all here this morning. Uh, thanks to Peter for leading us to worship. Martha for that wonderful prayer. Michael for the scripture reading. And Junmo for the songs. Man, those songs. And uh, it's great. Awesome. Words, verses. And I can't wait to sing uh, the last song. I want to welcome all of you. Those of you who are online, welcome. I want to especially welcome our youth group and our sixth graders. This is your first Sunday with us. Yes, let's welcome our sixth graders. <laughs> Woohoo! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for joining us. Now you make our worship more complete by your presence. That uh, we're so happy that you're here and worshiping with us. Now we're together, worshiping, and uh, you make us look better. <laughs> it's great to have you. Uh, if you remember, and uh, if you were here last Sunday, we talked about the essence of true Christianity. We are going through the book of Philippians, and we talked about the essence of Christianity, true Christianity, and the Apostle Paul gave us characteristics of true Christianity. What uh, does it look like? Uh, gave you three things last Sunday. It's, it's, it was uh, that uh, everything is spiritual in nature, that we glory in Jesus Christ, and that there is no confidence in flesh. That Apostle Paul says, I put no confidence in flesh. That everything is spiritual nature and his only righteousness and his only boast and his only joy is Jesus Christ. And today he talks about his, we're going to go through this passage, verse 4 and following, where he talks about his personal experience. So what does this boasting in Jesus look like? What does this uh, glory in Christ look like? actually look like, and Apostle Paul expounds that in his personal experience, personal life, and this is like a personal testimony that he gives. If we have enough time, especially for the sixth graders who are here and the youth group students, I would love to give uh, my, my personal testimony story and how I came to uh, church and I came to Christ. I hope that uh, I get a chance to do that, to do that in youth group, I did that a couple of years ago or last year. But today we'll talk about Paul's conversion, how Paul experienced Jesus, and we're going to just do look at three things knowing, being, and doing. That involves his 
conversion experience involves his whole existence, his personhood. So what's it mean to boast in Jesus? What's it mean to glory in Christ? What's it mean to have righteousness of Jesus and none other? And how do we get to have that experience is through knowing, being, doing. So we'll go through those three things briefly. Hopefully I can make it brief because uh, I don't want to give my first impression to our sixth graders that sermons are really long and boring. And you probably came with that assumption anyway, but uh, so I'm debating whether I should surprise you or just, you know, let you uh, live with that expectation forever. Now, but uh, let, let's, let's see what happens here. Knowing, first of all, Paul says, I consider everything lost. I consider everything lost so that I may know Christ and the power of his resurrection. I consider everything I have as lost so that I may know Christ. Let me just uh, show you how important this is. Paul says now that he's a Christian. The highest ambition he has is to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. He says, I count all things, all things lost. And you just read that. Uh, when he uses the word that we may know in verse 10, we have to read verses 3 to 8. That's very important. And, and, and it has everything to do with what he wants to know and how important that is. That he's saying that his desire to know Christ is above everything. Can you imagine this guy? He says, my biggest desire in life, my biggest ambition in life is to know Jesus. That's, that's a radical statement. For example, he says, I'm, a prou I'm, I'm proud of being a Jew. I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. I'm proud of my family. I'm a tribe of Benjamin. And he still is. You can read as he says, I know and I'm proud of uh, being chosen by God, and I know the law, and, and God loves me, and I'm proud of being a person who knows everything about God's law. I'm proud. I'm proud of my education. I'm proud of my ethnicity. I'm proud of my family. I'm proud of my knowledge. I'm proud of my education. I'm proud of my wealth. I'm proud of my connection. I'm proud of my networks. And I am proud of who I am because I got all that. It's great. And then he says, but when I became a Christian, these things I used to boast in, these things I used to glory in, those things that were my pride, those things that were my identity, those things that were my highest ambition, religious observance, family status, national pedigree, those things are not important anymore. That's what Paul is saying. I have a higher ambition above all. There's one thing I want, his passion his number one ambition now is to know Christ. This is radical stuff. I, I hope that you see that to be a Christian is not simply believe in a set of propositions. And, and I hope that. I, I, I hope that you don't think being a Christian is, okay, these are a set of propositions here and I believe them, therefore I'm a Christian. It's true but there's much more to that. It's to say, I count everything as loss. I count everything as rubbish. Rubbish is like garbage. I count everything as garbage in comparison with my number one ambition to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. What's that mean? I got this good illustration from one of the pastors. Knowing Christ is like seeing things through my eyeglasses. Knowing Christ is seeing things through my eyeglasses. It's just like that. Now, let me tell you what I mean. I 
I don't spend all of my time seeing my glasses. But I spend all of my time seeing things through my glasses. If the relationship between my glasses and me get off in any way, if it goes down too down, if they get too dirty, my perception of everything is changed. Like if I go like this, I can kind of see this, but I can't see you. I can see like images, but I can't see your facial expression. I don't know if you're happy or bored. Now I can see you. So everything I see is based on my perception and how I look through my glasses. A person with a knowledge of Christ isn't necessarily always talking about Christ. A person who knows Christ is not a person who is always talking about Christ or always talking to Christ, but seeing everything through Christ. You interpret and look everything through Christ. You don't always talk about Christ. You're not always talking to Christ, like I said. But you look everything through Christ. There are many people who are religious, and they come to church, but they deal with life in a very non-Christian way. There might be many of you who come to church. And uh, you come to church, and you say you're Christian, but you interact and you live your life as if your relationship with Christ doesn't matter that much. They don't try to understand things through Christ. How do you deal with your worry? How do you deal with bitterness? How do you deal with your fear? How do you decide how much money to spend in a year or, or how, what are you going to do with your wealth? How do you decide what kind of lifestyle you want to have? How do you decide on what kind of relationships you should maintain or keep or develop? How do you do all those things? You see, I think this is the discrepancy here. There's a huge gap between a lot of religious people who come to church and say, well, I believe in a set of propositions, but in terms of how you actually live out your life, the propositions or the person that you believe has nothing to do with your decisions. We're not that much different from non-religious people or non-Christians. We don't interpret things through, and we don't see things through our glasses. It's like, we do whatever we want. There are a lot of people like that. And Apostle Paul, when he says Christ, value of knowing Christ, he says he thinks through everything through his Christ values, what Christ has. For a person with knowledge of Christ, Christ is like the glasses. Christ is your eyes. You're not necessarily always seeing Christ, but you're always seeing everything through him. You can't hear him, but you understand what he's saying. You see, I'm married to a real person, those of you who are wondering. I'm married for 31 years, and, and uh, she's, she's a real person. And I plan my whole life with her in mind. I plan my schedule with her in mind. Sometimes I get selfish, of course, and I try to do my own ways. But knowing and having a marriage relationship means that I see everything through her in mind. Because I'm so intricately connected with my wife, that I can't imagine 
thinking, deciding, moving, making decisions without her. Now, I don't always sit under her and go, you're so beautiful. I want to turn my eyes to you and see you. Oh, I don't always do that. She does, but I don't, you see. So <laughs> I, I don't always like, oh, I got to, oh. But she's always there. That's real relationship. It's like that in your knowledge of Jesus Christ. You gauge your relationship and knowing Christ by, do I have this passion? Do I have this? Yeah, you should, but you have this person and you interpret things in life through this person, whoever is the most important. And Apostle Paul is saying, Christ is like that to him. That I see things through Christ. Do you know Christ? I count everything as rubbish. My pedigree, my status, my professional career, my academic career, I count them as rubbish compared to knowing him. That's the test. One of the ways you can tell the difference between people who have a, who have a, a, a form of religion without the power of real relationship with Christ is right here. I find religious people, not Christians, but just regular religious people, they're very busy in their religion. They do a lot of religious activities. And they expect things to go their way. And if they find that things don't go their way, they say, oh, my religion does work, I give up, and I'll move on to another religion. That's what a lot of people, that's how they operate many times. Paul says, I used to enjoy being a Jew. I still am a Jew. I used to enjoy being an academic. I still being an academic professor. I used to enjoy studying the law of God. I still enjoy it. What's changed? Everything has changed because now these things that used to be my confidence, my identity, my joy, my hope, these things are now second things. I have one superior ambition, surpassing ambition to know him. If troubles in my academic career and if troubles in my love life, if troubles in all these things happen to me, these troubles help me to know Christ better because my number one ambition is to know Christ. That's what Paul is saying. Can you relate to him? Can you relate to him? And that's not all he's saying. There's a knowing part, but there's also being part. Paul also says, I want to know the power of his resurrection. Now, what's that? The difference between knowing Christ and knowing the power of his resurrection is Paul saying that there's a difference between knowing a person and resembling a person. When we know Christ, then we are dealing with him personally. The power of resurrection is the life energy, that power, that life that took this dead body and raised him up. And this is saying the same power that came into Jesus' body and raised him up came into his dead body and raised him up. And for you and for me as well. It's not just talking about relationships. It's talking about this supernatural change. Supernatural change of character growth. When he says, I want to know him, that means I want to be with him. When he says, I want to know him in his resurrection, that means I want to be just like him. I want to know him. I want to be with him. I want to know him in his resurrection. I want to be like him. Understanding the power and understanding what it means to love. And this is what Paul is saying. The power of the Holy Spirit comes into your life. Then you decide to receive him as the Lord and Savior. The power of the Holy Spirit will come. And the power of the Holy Spirit will come and regenerate. This is the 
hard theological word, regenerate. And that's what theologians call conversion or regeneration. That the Holy Spirit will change something in our hearts, then we're able to believe. It's the power of resurrection. The same thing that raised Jesus from the dead. Look at your life and look at Paul's life. He says, I also want to know the power of his resurrection. I want to be like him. I want to have his boldness. I want to have his love. I want to have his wisdom. I want to have his power. I want to be able to take criticism like Christ had, and I want to be able to be generous like Jesus. I want to be able to be humble as he is, and I want to be as courageous as he. I want to be as soft and as tough. I want to be as wise and as simple as Christ. I want to be like him. That's the confession. That's his testimony. And I hope you see how it works. The more you know him, the more you grow into the power of the resurrection. The more time you spend with him, the more you see him. The more time you seek his love, the more time you spend in his word, in prayer, and knowing him, you become like him. I want to know him, and I want to know him in the power of resurrection. Do you want to know him in the power of resurrection? If I was a Baptist preacher, I'd be saying, turn to your neighbor and say, ask, do you want to know the power of resurrection? Youth group students, turn to your parents and say, do you want to know the power of resurrection? (laughs) Thank you. Thank you, youth students. I'm so glad you're here. You make us complete. How do we experience life as it's supposed to be? Confident, joyful, loving, generous, kind, and so forth. The answer is the dead stuff is taken over by the Spirit of God when you believe Jesus. And you make him your number one ambition. Are you satisfied with your life? Is there vibrancy in your life? Are you just going through, uh, I can't wait to just get over. Yeah, that's part of life too. But is there power that's pushing you through? Is this like boring? When you look at your marriage and you're like, this is not what I expected. Look at our children and go like, okay, it's challenging. And you look at your parents, it's like, the other kids' parents are much cooler than my parents. Right? And, and you're like, what's going on? It's, something's not right. Because you want these things that Apostle Paul held so dearly once, and he says these things are important, these things are good, but they're not my number one ambition anymore. Paul says, my number one ambition is to know Christ and to know him in his resurrection. To be with him and to be like him. Many people don't just believe in propositions. Many people believe that Jesus died for them, believe the historical facts. But the real agenda is their personal happiness and success. People go to God when they want to. People go to Christ when they need to. But Paul says, Christ, Christian is somebody who's turned all their around. So success is knowing the power of his resurrection. Everything else comes second. Third, being. Paul says here also, he says, I share in his suffering. I want to know him. I want to know him in the power of resurrection. 
and that I share with him in his suffering. I share his suffering. Somebody says that doesn't make sense. When you say, logically speaking, I want to be like him in his death so that I can be raised up. Why does Apostle Paul says, I want to know the power of his resurrection, and then he says, and to share in his suffering and to be comfortable with death. What does that mean? But I think it's perfectly logical if you follow through Apostle Paul's mind here. If you go out into the world resembling Jesus, that's the power of resurrection. By his supernatural power within you resembling Jesus, when you want to be with him, when you resemble him, and when you're like him in this world, when you serve other people, when you always tell the truth in love, when you love people who are hard to love, when you look after the orphans and the poor, when your heart is after the refugees and the marginalized, when you want to protect life inside and outside of mother's womb, you go out of your way to serve people and you get criticized. If you do all that stuff, what's going to happen? You're going to find the suffering of Jesus reenacted in your life. You will experience Jesus' suffering. They're going to take an advantage of sometimes. People say, what in the world? People are going to be unhappy with you. And people will be offended by you sometimes. They were at Jesus. They took advantage of Jesus and they were offended by Jesus. For being Jesus. And if we're to be like Jesus... We're going to be offended, and we will offend people, and we'll get hurt. We'll be criticized. That's the death. That's the suffering that he's talking about. That's where verse 11 comes in. You know Christ, and that stirs up the power of the resurrection. That actually reenacts the suffering of Jesus. There will be troubles in your life. There will be persecutions. There will be mistreatments. Up until you can say, like Apostle Paul, I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. This is one person paraphrasing what Jesus said when he said, I am the resurrection and life. I'm the resurrection and life. The one who believes in me will live and though he die and whoever lives by believing in me, will never die. Let me close this way. I hope you see this. To know Christ, the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship in his suffering, until we retain and attain to our own resurrection, and that we're complete in him. And his power of resurrection is complete in us. You can't just be blah about this. This is a big deal. It's a big deal to me. It's such a big deal to me that I devoted my whole life to talk about this. And it's a big deal to all of you that you devoted your life to talk about this. The only difference between you and me is I get paid and you don't. That's the only difference. <laughs> Something has taken my life. My heart was cold. Now it's warm. My heart was hard, it's soft, 
My heart was stagnant. Now it's fresh. When you try to talk about it, the change you're describing is so radical, you can't contain it. It's my number one ambition in life. know him, to know him in his resurrection, to share his suffering. My whole existence of knowing, being, and doing, it's all wrapped up in Christ, in his death and resurrection. And that's the happiness we're after. That's success. That's success. Apostle Paul says, I'm the most successful person in this world. Not because I have all these degrees and wealth and networks and fame. Because I know Christ. Christ. Because I know him in his resurrection. And God knows that. And he invites us. Says, I want you to know me. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And said, this is my body given for you. Eat it in remembrance of me. Join me in my resurrection and my suffering. And after the meal, he took the cup and said, this is my blood, a blood of new covenant, given for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Drink it in remembrance of me. Every time you eat and drink, you're proclaiming this, my death and resurrection. You're praying to Proclaim the gospel. For me, my application today, every time I eat and drink, I'm proclaiming to the world, this is my number one ambition. This is what I glory in, to know Christ and to be found by him. What are you proclaiming as you eat and drink today? What are going to be your number one ambition? What's going to be your success? This is no light matter, is it? It's not just a ritual that we follow every week. We're proclaiming something. And I hope you can take this seriously. Those of you who are baptized, when you were baptized, that's what you said. <laughs> I don't know if you knew it. I don't know if your preacher told you that, but when you're baptized, you're saying, I die with Jesus, and I rise with Christ, and I'm with him. When you're confirmed, you students, that's what you said. And I hope you can continue to say that. Those of you who are not confirmed or baptized, refrain from taking it. Just reflect on it and think about it. And uh, from next week, we will put in the prayers for those who are taking communion and those who are not taking communion and those who are asking questions about communion in the bulletin. You can check in the bulletin as well. I want you to open up your uh, communion cups and have the first layer, that's the wafer, second layer is the cup we're going to eat and drink together with the bread that signifies the body of Christ and with the cup that signifies the blood of Jesus in your both hands and reminding yourself, let's confess our faith.